Welcome to Second Congregational Church. Uh, our, this is our video newsletter. I'm Reverend Sean. I'm Reverend Max. It's great to see you. And uh, another week has passed and we're still not allowed to go out. We're still not playing. We're still not going to school. When is this going to end, right? Right, right. Well, there, <laughs> there's a lot of that going around. A lot of people are really beginning to ask that question now, sort of, you know, the fun part of this is over. You know, they uh, I sort of want to step back a little bit and say, I don't want to make light of, of the idea that this has just been fun for people, but there was a kind of novelty effect, certainly for a while, yeah. right? And uh, we were learning to do some new things, doing some things in some new ways, and uh, there was a lot in that that kind of had a, sort was sort of fun to try things yeah. in, a, in a different way, and now suddenly that reality of, oh, now we've got to really adjust is beginning to, to no, settle in. the kids in. have all, you know, I, I have uh, some kids who are hearing back from schools, you know, going to college for the oh, first time. right, sure. And yeah. at first it was all, oh, yeah, we have some time off. And now it's, this is my experience. Yeah. I was supposed to go away to school. <laughs> right. And hearing about getting into your your choice school and then the reality that you might be all in attending the University of Phoenix right <laughs> and taking your classes online that that i'm i'm resisting this so much yeah yeah that it's it's i'm observing you know why am i so frustrated why am i uh anxious why yeah. why do i feel like i have even more to do than i did when i wasn't uh, when we weren't in this situation. Uh, and it's made me step back and say, what's going on inside of me? Yeah. And uh, as pastors, that, you know, that's kind of our realm right, right. to deal with the spiritual. But when it's happening to you, and it can happen to anybody, uh, how do you address that? How do you ass assess, you know, we're in a difficult time. A lot of us were in this role of caretakers. Right, sure. Uh, and we did quite a bit of caretaking, but does it catch up to you? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, the answer is, of course, yes, it does. And, and, you know, we're all in this sort of dance that we're doing. You put it a, a good way before we started taping. The, the, the reality is, is we're all in this space of uh, dancing between resistance and acceptance yeah. in different kinds of ways and and that's that's him not me but uh, but I think you're really right about that and I think one of the things that's really true for caregivers whether you're a pastor or a parent or a, a right. dutiful adult child with older parents who, who a or, lot of or, us or, are caregivers now, exactly right, yeah. right. Uh, this caregiving has 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 broadened and and we're all doing it and one of the things that I think is, is true is that no matter how well you sort of shift into that caregiving mode or how accustomed to it you are, we're all resisting yeah. things. They're, they're, we're accepting lots of things, too. Those tend not to be the, the things that kind of come for most in our minds in a time like this. But even people for whom caregiving comes quite naturally find themselves, we find ourselves resisting what this all entails yeah. in, in some new ways. I mean, I'm very good at being with people in pretty grim circumstances. I was a hospital chaplain on a pediatrics ward for 18 months before I came here, so I've, I've been in some really fraught, emotional, difficult situations. What's been hard for me has been something that's so much less sort of fraught than that. What's been hard for me has actually been sharing the space of my home during the course of a day because I don't have to do that typically. During the course of the day, you know, Liz and, and Grace will go off to school. They're yeah. usually out the door by 7 o'clock. I'm dropping Emily off at her school just down the street from here at 8 o'clock. And so by 8.15, silence has descended on the house. <laughs> and I can stretch out at the dining room table and have my piles of books yeah, and my yeah. coffee precariously balanced on the top of something and have my phone going and my laptop open and, and 
take a break by kind of walking around or, or what, all of these things that I'm used to as my ways of, of working. And of course, that's absolutely what's in flux right now. Yeah. And so it's interesting. So where do you find the resistance? What does the resistance look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like for me. There's a particular room in our house, which is the house where Max has his piles of books. <laughs> that's a particular place. And because of the new situation that we're in, Liz has had to commandeer a big part of that room to be able to do her work of, of running an upper school, which is a tremendous job, as you can imagine. Yeah. So you might wonder, well, so Max, when did you get around to really cleaning your stuff <laughs> out of that room so Liz can work in an environment that really is... is sort of organized around her needs, which are the needs yeah. of, for that room right now. And the answer to that is, that would be last night. <laughs> That'd be last night that I kind of got around to doing that. And, and what is that about? That's about my resisting. Yeah. Well, this that space this, was yours. Exactly. That, yeah. that, that it isn't my space. It's our space. Yeah. And that functionally, that has to mean something different now. And... I was not aware that I was resisting that till you gave me that <laughs> language about 20 minutes ago, but, but there it is, right? Yeah. I mean, and then these are the circumstances I think that we all find ourselves in right now. Um, so, yeah. so with that confession that I make to the world, w where have you found some resistance in yourself? Yeah, you know, this uneasiness is definitely in the air. Uh, I pride myself on being a controlled calm person but I have found myself being less controlled and less calm internally mm. and that's when I really get like that's the sacred place and now that say my sacred space my, my desk is is inside mm. and it's being pushed on yeah uh, when you're caring for everybody you know and that's our job but you go home and you have to care there because everybody's, there's this uneasy, you start to say, something is off inside of me, and hold on a second, everybody's a little bit off. Right. Wait, this is an off time? Uh, yeah, of course, I'm, what I'm feeling is right. <laughs> I right. should be feeling this way. Right. And now, when you accept that, see, the resistance was, I, this is going to pass. Everybody's overreacting. The schools will be back up. Easter, Max, we don't need to talk about that because even the president said we, we should be getting back. Right. And now the date just keeps getting pushed yeah. further. Right. And this is starting to look like what normal is. But when this is normal, and internally I'm saying this is not normal, I'm resisting it. This is where conflict, internal conflict yeah. comes. Sure. And I had this kind of revelation where I had to accept. I'm still not there yet. I have not fully accepted this. Uh, but I am observing that the conflict is there. And where does the conflict come from? This resistance. And what am I resisting? The environment, this climate. And so, yeah, while we're doing newsletters and going to do Easter and have to go home after work, uh, what's going on inside of me? Resistance, conflict. And you might see that pop its ugly head into just a normal everyday situation. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. I mean, uh, maybe as you guys are, are watching us talking, you know, have you found yourself sort of weirdly caring uh, about something that normally would not be very important at no. all? Are there, are there things that sort of loom larger than they would or should? Yeah. And on some level, you didn't know you could care Are you that triggered? Much? Yeah, are you How, yeah. Are you triggered? Yeah. Very quickly. Yeah. And to know that, that there is something going on inside, and this is the spiritual... Yeah. kind of dimension uh, that Max and I deal with. Some might say, you know, 
psychological realm, sure. but we're dealing with an invisible realm yep. that has uh, implications in our material realm. Absolutely, that's and right. How we feel is often how we behave. Absolutely right. Yeah, you know, the, the Talmud has a wonderful uh, piece of wisdom on this. It says, we do not see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Wow. And that is so, uh, it's always true, <laughs> but yeah. you realize the lenses that we bring to the world and how reality reflects those lenses in a particular kind of way right now. And how it is we grapple with that, what are the tools that we bring to that reality are all the more important for us to, to begin yeah. to, to really think about. And yeah. uh, so that's, that's very powerful now. So I'm curious, sort of thinking about that, you know, what, when you're thinking about the sermon, we got Palm Sunday coming up. It's a big, yeah. a big day and a wonderful celebration in the life of the church. You're looking to um, to have Palm Saturday on uh, on Eve, at Even Song at 5 p.m. on on Saturday night. So what do, what do you what do you what's your word going to be for for Palm Saturday? Uh, I don't I don't want to give it away too much, but we all know that this is the day where we take our palms and we wave them, you know, and we're uh, symbolically celebrating the. Uh, the part in the Bible where Jesus rides the donkey into town right. and everybody's, you know, so excited that Jesus has come that he's almost being called, you know, he's, they want, they want him to be the king, right? That he, this is the king they always wanted. And, uh, we're going to see a lot transpire in that one week, but, uh, Jesus, you know, thinking about that word resistance and, this ride into Jerusalem and, and we're giving, we're, we're, we're given the, this, this hint that Jesus kind of knows what he's walking into. Right. Right. And the resistance that you would feel the, the, the discomfort. And here Jesus is in this occasion where you would never think that he has resistance in him. Right. Right. This is the high point. Yeah, sure. This is Pete Alonso just hit a grand slam home run, and he's rounding third, and he's coming home. This is what Jesus always wanted, but you, this, we know that something is not right in this picture. Right. Yeah. Right, and, and you know, we as people who are grounded in this story sort of have this level of, you know, in literary terms, it's a moment of tragic irony, yes. right? Because we know what happens after this story in a way that certainly the disciples, the people in the crowd themselves don't seem to know and yeah. that the crowd will itself turn on him mm. even though on this earlier day they're cheering him and welcoming him is something that we as folks who know the story cannot help but read as we read this account of that story. Yeah. And to what extent does Jesus know that that's what's ahead is something that the church has always tried to imagine in all kinds of, yeah. of different ways. But you're absolutely right. What the story tells us, certainly as it points to, to the Thursday later in that week, to Monday Thursday, which is the night when the, uh, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, this idea that he is resisting what is to come. And with that story of Jesus in the Garden is all about yeah. resistance and finding his way to at least a measure of acceptance yeah. is absolutely what is sort of happening for him and in him over the course of these days. And so to think about well, where is that in the Palm Sunday story yeah. itself is, is really intriguing. We, for Bible study this week, I had them not only look at the Palm Sunday story, but we looked at two clips, one from Jesus Christ Superstar huh. and the other from the 1988 movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. And they're two different, but in many ways similar, imaginative renderings of this moment of the entry into Jerusalem. And it's fascinating because in both of them, 
Jesus is not smiling for the crowds like he's there with the motorcade after his inauguration, right? It's yeah. not... His little Pope mobile. Exactly. <laughs> this is not a happy thing. It's yeah. a very internal moment yeah. for him because he seems to know in both of those stories, different as they are, exactly what it means for him to be going to Jerusalem. And so that sense of his active working through yeah. is being depicted in a way that that's really powerful. And of course, you have the incredible joy of the disciples, the confusion yeah. of uh, Judas about well, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Yeah. What are you? What? What is this? What are you doing? Isn't this our moment? You know, all of that is happening. Yeah. And um, there is on some other level that in those stories, the resistance of the crowds, the resistance of the disciples themselves, who have very firm expectations yes. about who the Messiah is, and what the return of the Messiah represents for them politically, yeah. socially. And so they're coming from a place of very, very firm resistance that what God has in store is going to be more complicated and more wonderful even than they have been led to believe. And their inability to live into a God who does new things is very much a feature of what happens in the course of Holy Week, through, through the whole yeah. course of Holy Week. Um, and, and, and Judas's betrayal is all about his refusal to allow Jesus to be anything other than yeah. exactly what he, Judas, decides that God is supposed to be and God is supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, no, it's, that's it, in the story. It's that rest, you know, it, I, I love the Bible because uh, in the words of Paul Ricoeur, you know, Logos is coming from the mythos. Like yeah. you, you cited two different representations, but you know interpretively that if they get the, the essence of that moment, what it is to, there, there is a resistance to, uh, you know, going out on stage and performing. Yeah. And that fear, it's called stage fright. Right. And then the, the, the joy when you've got on stage and you've done it, right. it doesn't matter what everybody thought. Yeah. It matters, did you do what you had to do? Mm -hmm. And I think we all wonder what God is up to, but what's evident is this moment. Mm-hmm. Right. There's no deny. I know what God is up to. This moment. Yeah. This absolutely. very moment. And I'm here. And all I know is that, again, it's this God who's walking with me, who's yeah. saying, oh, you feel resistance, huh? Okay. Yeah. Keep, let's see what happens. Because it's that, it's the resistance that the seed feels when it's pushing through the earth. The resistance the child does, just doesn't want to leave the womb. It's always going to be resistance that, uh, because it's a breaking through. And yeah. this new perspective of Jesus, we're, we'll get into that born again and that whole process of, of what God is up to might just be in these stages of resistance, something new. Right. is formed absolutely then this uh dr widbin would of often show us the psalms in light of the orientation this is how i first was disorientation this is how i now am and reorientation N having b been disoriented and knowing that i was oriented on shaky ground i'm now this new yeah creation right well, and isn't that hopeful for all yes. of us right now, right? Yeah. As we are experiencing, I think, this transition from orientation to disorientation. We will not be the same people yeah. Yeah. once this is all. That's for sure. Yeah. So hold on and see what God is turning us into through all of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, uh, Max, with, you know, as you said, this Saturday is Palm, uh, this Palm Saturday, Palm Sunday, uh, 
what, how can people worship with us through the holidays? So we have a lot that we're going to be offering online, and we're really excited for that. We've been putting a lot of thought, as you might imagine, into how we're going to do that. And so the process of, of preparing for Holy Week and entering into the story of Holy Week happens starting on Saturday at Evensong at 5 p.m. Then on Sunday at 10.30, we'll have our uh, main worship service are uh, here in the, well, they're both in the sanctuary now. So it, yes. it used to be we would say one's in the chapel and one's in the sanctuary. They're both currently in the sanctuary, which we're really enjoying. So that's going to be 1030 on Sunday and definitely looking forward to that. Musically, we have some things we're really yes. actually very excited to, to do. We're not going to tell you what they are, but uh, it's, it's good and you're going to want to have tuned in. Then on Thursday, at um, 7 p.m., we have our Monday Thursday service. That'll be also here in the sanctuary. You'll be able to tune in online. And that is a communion service, and which is, which is interesting to think through. What is communion at a time when, you know, people are watching vir virtually? What I will tell you we will not do, I'm not going to say, okay, now go to your refrigerator and get <laughs> some grape juice pour it in a little cup. Um, it's going to be a visual representation of communion yeah. in keeping with the idea that Monday Thursday is also the night when Jesus uh, holds the Last Supper and ordains the practice of communion for faithful people. Then there'll be a series of readings that kind of follow from that that tell the story of the arrest of Jesus. Then on Friday, also in the evening will be, or actually that may be in the afternoon mm. depending, so we, we're still thinking through the time. But on Good Friday, we will have a service really telling the story of the, the death of Jesus on the cross. It is famous for being a somber service, but I would just encourage people, do tune in. It's, it's not a service that often people make a point of attending physically, and maybe there is all the more temptation now that it's online. You say, well, you know, I'm not going to bother. Yeah. It's a beautiful service. It's a powerful service, and it's a way that the church really tries to name some of the complicated emotional terrain that believers feel even in the best of circumstances. And it's a day when we really seek to imagine what is the world without God in it? Hmm. And that's such an important yeah. question, which is not to say the world does not have God in it, but we need to sort of look at that in a, in a, in a pretty direct way. Yeah. And this is the day when the church really seeks to do that. And then, of course, on Easter Sunday proper, uh, 1030 service, we are, again, musically, we want to do some really cool stuff, and there will be as, as much celebration as we can bring to you uh, live uh, and not have you here, but we're excited for all of those things, and all of them in their own way are opportunities for you and for us all to live into this season and to really have this be a rich spiritual experience yeah. and an opportunity to reflect on where are the resistances in us and what is it that brings us with the help of God into places of acceptance because there are some things that we just need to accept yeah. and there are ways to do that that are deeply faithful. At the same time, there are also things that we're not being asked to accept and there are ways in which our continuing pushing back against injustice, are continuing to push back against all of the b reality of brokenness in the world, that's still really important to do. And to simply become resigned to that would be to really misunderstand the spiritual call of this moment. And yeah. Easter's all about that story, all about finding ways to do that work. And so um, Easter's more important than ever for us as individual spiritual pilgrims in the, in, you know, through, this, through this strange time. And so I'm really thinking about that. I'm really feeling that and feeling like we're going to have a lot to offer yeah. uh, for folks who are, who are looking for ways to do that work. Yeah. I had a friend who said you know, in, the, in the early church, people would go to church because they were sick. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And 
we're we're not as free anymore to to kind of boldly do that. It, it, but in our way, what Max and I want to do is, this is a spiritual experience for a lot of us. This is a an alone experience, or maybe you have some new uh, company, which th- that's your very family yeah, <laughs> that right. you just have never you haven't lived with them for 24 Mm 7 and you're learning how to do this Uh, the whole concept behind church is is that you're not alone we're doing this collectively i know it might feel like that easter will not be the celebrated alone in our houses we will all be celebrating Uh, in our churches we will we will be celebrating and uh, through uh, our prayer, just think, we can be joined together. Absolutely. Our thoughts, our efforts, our, our desire to continue and fight through, this is all something we're doing together, and we share this in Christ. Christ Absolutely. who leads by example. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. What, what does Easter teaches, teach us? Easter teaches us that physical distance, the distance of mortality itself, are nothing compared to the power of love of, of the love of God to unify us. And so in this time when we are trying to live into the reality of being distanced, we are given an opportunity to think about all the ways in which we nevertheless are still together. And we are together still in the deepest ways. Yeah. And finding ways to affirm that and to follow where that leads us are all in front of us right now. And there's something that is very powerful and very moving about that. And so if we are able to help you do that work, we're eager to do that. We're gonna shift now to a time of prayer. I wanna especially lift up today, uh, Morgan Felleter, who uh, had a had a bike accident and um, she's doing great. She had to have a procedure to put some pins in a hand, which sounds pretty, or in a wrist. <laughs> yeah, that's that sounds really, really fun. painful. But yeah. Morgan is, is a really strong person and um, has been able to do that with minimal fuss, which is yeah. kind of the Morgan way, but definitely want to keep Morgan in our prayers today. Yeah. And uh, as, lately, I'm also really thinking about people who are in our uh, nursing homes and skilled skilled facilities of various yeah. kinds because they're uh, cut off. We also had kind of along those lines the, the loss of someone who's very, very precious to Second Congregational Church. She uh, did not die because of coronavirus, but Grace Jones, who is the oldest member of our church, died at the age of 104 this week. And so wow. she was a remarkable lady who led a fascinating life of tremendous devotion and service. And so we will miss her horribly. I am looking at her pew and the exact place that she sat right now. And so I had really been hoping that we'd get to see her just a few more times. Uh, we knew that the Sunday access was slowing down and had been for some time, but, but we, we still held out hope for just one or two more visits anyway, and, and it's not going to happen. But we are glad to have known her, and we know where she is, and uh, she is in a place with no more tears, and the love of her life, her husband Reg, uh, very much by her side again. And there's something in that that all we can be is grateful and happy, and uh, yet we are really going to miss her. So with Morgan and with Grace and all our folks yeah. in, in assisted living very much in our minds, invite you to uh, join us in prayer. Yeah. Uh, Max, as, as we're going into a time of prayer, do you want to just join me and look? You said something about where Grace sat. When I look yes. out, I can see, you know, we have a unique position sometimes where right. we, we're looking. I can remember, I, I know exactly where people sit. Yep. And Absolutely. as I'm praying, I'm going to actually, you're going to see me pan the room. And that's just my way of saying I, right. I miss you. Right. <laughs> There's Kathy and Liz yeah. right there. Yeah. That's Pat and Corolla. Yeah. And uh, Kathy sits down Kathy here. Is there. Lisa, the Hellmans. The Hellmans yeah, are yeah. there. Uh, Craig and Georgia are yeah. there. Steve Scroggins kind of over there. Jackie sits there. G- and Rick and Debbie sit back there. Absolutely. They kinda, yes, yeah. they do. Um, and uh, 
Yo, now we're going to not name no, no. some people. If you don't get named, I, it doesn't mean we don't know where you sit. Right? Well, I was thinking how far we're going to take this. I right. know the Azores sit over there. Yeah, the Azores are there. Uh, Jessica Stanchu's yeah. over there. Ashley is often Scott there. Party Scott Party is in the yeah. back. Absolutely, yeah. We Jeez. we could just yeah. we could do this for a long time. Um, so and you're here. We, we know you're here. We feel that 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 presence with us. So. What we're doing by this is saying, pray with us. Yeah. As we 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 know you have a place in this room. Yeah. So we invite that presence here. We invite that presence here, and we we take a big deep breath in. You can hear the am, ambulance every now when it comes by. I spike. I <laughs> I always feel like oh, it's something. We're just going to give yeah. that a second. Yeah, let's let's listen to that because that's going on. These sirens, they do something to you. It creates a anxiousness, uh, an alertness. And every time a siren doesn't go by, you don't say, oh, the sirens, you know, everybody stop. You just, it, it evokes, it brings a feeling inside of you. And when we pray and when we meditate, we observe these feelings. These feelings that have tremendous effects on the way we are. So as we hear sirens, see that red flashing banner on the TV that says, you know, like warning or danger, or you see people walking, friends, with masks on, almost kind of saying, keep your distance. How does that make me feel? How does that make you feel? Now let's just throw on top of that, that we have to keep going, we have to keep working, we have to take care of our kids. We gotta, our boss still wants our project in. Dinner has to get made. All with that feeling inside not being addressed. But Jesus shows us that if we are just still, if we can just breathe, then that chaotic temp tempest that I just described, see in all the pictures, Jesus is calm in the storm, casually riding a donkey into, into Good Friday. Jesus knows where his feet are planted, and in prayer we're reminded to keep them where they need to be. this time we lift up people, everybody. Do, are there names? Are there people you want to encourage? Can you send those requests out to the heavens? Things that you need to be grateful for. Some things that you might need to revisit to make better. This is what God offers us in this experience called life, where we get to walk through not knowing what's ahead, 
but taking comfort that I'm right where I need to be. And when we lose sight of that, when we lose focus, when we kind of can't wrestle anymore, our way of saying uncle to the heavens, Jesus teaches his disciples to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.